And um, we're going to explore this culture that is very different to our society today. But at the same time, there's some similarities to our culture. And I'm going to through the talk try to explain those differences and similarities so we can understand them a little bit more. And that understanding of you know, the Aztecs is not so easy because when the conquistadors went to Mesoamerica in the 15th, 16th century, the, the stories that left us and other people who came subsequently afterwards and the stories they left us and the writings that left us of the Aztecs, they're not always the most accurate description of their time, of their traditions, of their culture. So we have to do a little bit of the detective work to try to see what's valid and what's not. And a lot of scholars of the last number of centuries have um, engaged in that process of trying to develop an, an image or reflection of what the Aztecs were really like. So in this talk I'm going to try to present um, as best as of an image that I can. And I'm going to use a comparative study as well, or a comparative approach. Because we can learn a lot from the Aztecs by looking at a lot of different traditions as well. So, in this talk, I'm going to use two lenses to help understand them. One lens is mythology, and the other lens is philosophy. Mythology is the, you can describe it as stories or sacred stories passed on from one generation to another, to pass on teachings, values, uh, views of life, ways of living from one generation to the other. In philosophy, it's to take those timeless stories, sacred stories, or personal stories, societal stories, and try to understand them in a very deeper way through process of questioning, reflection, introspection. So there are two different ways, two, two different complementary approaches to understanding the Aztec world, but we can also use them to understand ourselves, understand life. So, and it's interesting when you, you do that, when scholars have done that, it's interesting that the Aztecs have ideas, ways of life, teachings that are very similar to other cultures around the world. And we're going to see that in a few minutes. Why is that? Because the human being at the core is very, around the world, they're all the same. At the core, I know there's external differences and cultural differences, but in their essence, we're all deep down very much the same. And people's experiences, and their, their needs, the timeless questions of who they are, where they came from, what's the meaning of life, where we're going, the, the uh, ability to extract uh, lessons from experiences that we all have, well, they turn out to be more or less the same. Now, I know the form may be different, the, the emphasis might be different, but deep down, they're seeing similar things. So, to understand this text a little bit more, we're going to help place ourselves in the historical context of the time. So we're going to look at their history a little bit to understand where, their, <coughs> where they came from. And Aztecs came, lived in the, the Mesoamerica uh, region. Mesoamerica means middle, so Mesoamerica is the Central America, and there's these different civilizations that lived there before the Aztecs. So that text, text lived, moved to this uh, region of uh, Mexico, which is uh, Mexico. But before that, there lived um, different civilizations there. One of those was the Olmec civilization. We should usually know those, recognize those with the, remember the huge heads, these huge statues that are enormous. So the Olmecs. We don't know much about them, but after the Olmecs, then they came the those Maya as well, this area of the world. Tihuacan Pan, a civilization existed as well. And that's the uh, civilization that has the, the pyramid of the sun and the moon, um, not far from Mexico City. Huge pyramid, nearly as big as the uh, Giza pyramid in Egypt. And then after that civilization declined, what emerged was the Toltec. And they um, existed for a few hundred years. And then they declined as well. And then the Aztecs, uh, Aztecs came into the, the Valley of Mexico and they inherited that tradition. 
There wasn't egg that came in and that was brand new, but there was a tradition there that they inherited and continued. And they had their own tradition as well. So it's both. They both had their own, but they absorbed a lot. It's like in ancient Greece, the ancient, um, sorry, ancient Romans, the Romans absorbed a lot from the ancient Greek society. And they had their own traditions as well. It's a little bit like today in Ireland, we have an Irish culture, many different cultures, but we're very influenced by America as well. America influenced our culture. So that's the same idea. So it's just to understand when the Aztecs came into the Valley of Mexico from somewhere else, they inherited this tradition, these teachings. When the Aztecs arrived um, into the Valley of Mexico, it's a quite high plain, there was also other um, city-states existing there. It wasn't just a, a blank, open plot of land that you could just start planning things from day one. No, there was other city-states there. There was other um, people with their traditions. And they come in, and they have a myth where they, they say that um, an eagle landed on a cactus, and there was a sign, this is where we're going to build our home. So they built a spot, they got a spot along the lake, and there they started to build their, their capital. And then, over time, they formed an alliance with other city-states, and they became more and more powerful. They formed what's called the Triple Alliance, and there was a war between the different city-states, and eventually, the Aztecs gained more and more power, more and more influence, and it became very dominant in the Valley of Mexico. So, in parallel with that, in Europe, um, Christopher Columbus uh, wanted to sail to the west. He was looking for a new route to India, because at that time India was very uh, popular with trades in um, that area. So he, he said they thought that by traveling to the west, they could get to reach India through a new route. And he went on, this, uh, on his journeys, and they discovered America, I'm oh, sorry, discovered knew what the top was India, or in the Indies, and um, they realized that it was the new world. And it was a new world for us, the Europeans, but for them, the Mesoamericans, Americans, it wasn't the new, that was their old world. The Europeans was the new world. A different perspective. And there he, well, they, they knew the language to interpreters and um, in Oahu, and there they were able to talk to the locals when they landed in Mesoamerica in 1519. And then they heard of this empire, the Aztec Empire, great riches, great power, and they were very curious. And they heard of gold. Once they heard of gold, that was it. They were hooked. So when they went over the mountains, they went through the forests, they wanted to find this magical place. They heard legends about it. And when they went over the, the mountains of Mexico, of the valley, that's what they discovered. A little city-state, Tenochtitlan, And they discovered this city-state city on an island. You can see in the center, it's this beautiful, <coughs> at the heart of the city-state. And you have to imagine for Cortez, that, that's the leader of the group of Europeans, who went there and his companions, this was, uh, this was like a fairy tale. They've seen many great cities around Europe, and when here they were amazed. I mean, when you read your writings, it was like, wow, it was like, it's like Camelot. This was something they'd never thought of, but dreamt of. And they were so amazed by the architecture, the city streets, the, the way they lived, the vision of life. It was a very, it was a very um, special moment in history. So, but, when Cortez and his companions saw the riches and of this empire, they wanted to take it over. They wanted to use it for their own benefit. And eventually, to make a long story short, they, um, they, there was a, a, a fight, a war between Cortez and the city-states who were more friendly with the Aztecs. And eventually, they took over, uh, back the Aztecs, and took over the empire. You have to remember at this time there was a lot of plagues, a lot of diseases that the Europeans brought over. So at that time, uh, Mesoamerica was a much weakened uh, condition. So, what's afterwards then, Cortez wrote about his experiences. 
those friars, religious um, uh, organizations who came and to start to document this great culture, civilization. The Zenur was going to disappear with time. So they wanted to record it. Thankfully for us, for us they did, and we got their um, text today. But is it accurate? Is it totally accurate what they have written? Uh, one question I can ask is, who, who writes history? If there's a conflict between two or more groups, who writes history? The, the winners. winners. <laughs> and generally the winners write their view of what happened. Do they generally write the other person's view, point of view? Generally not. It's, it's their view. Um, so it's always, it's the expression is, it's always two sides of the story. An argument is always two sides. So in this side, we're only hearing one side of the story. And we need to take that into consideration when we read uh, Aztecs, um, what they're written about themselves, what the other people have written about them, so on and so forth. So it's a little bit of like detective work. You have to put the pieces together. Sometimes what they've written is true. Sometimes what they've written is true, but it's exaggerated. Sometimes what they've written is, it's a misunderstanding of what they've experienced or seen. There's a misunderstanding, but you must remember it's these two different cultures coming together, a big clash of cultures, the European and the Mesoamerica. Different visions of life, different symbolism, different mythologies. So we have to take that into consideration. And one uh, lens we're going to use to help understand the Aztecs is through the language of myth, or the, the language of myths. So what, what is a myth? Because today when we say the word myth, that's another picture of the center. That's not the plan. I'm probably butchering the pronunciation of these. I'm trying my best to try to learn how to pronounce these words properly. That's beautiful. That's what they, we think it looked like. So, how do we, what is a myth? A myth is a, generally when we say the word myth today, we mean something that's false. So it's only a myth, it's not true. But the word myth in traditional societies is, for them, it was a true story. So myth for them was a true story, and a story they used to transmit. So myths were used to transmit. Transmit what? Ancient ideas, values, uh, philosophies, ways of life, visions of life. They use these stories to transmit things from one generation to the other. And stories are a natural way of passing on information from one generation to the other. Why? Because we all love stories, don't we? We all love telling stories, we all love listening stories, we want to hear the, the, the punchline, what happened. Stories we heard 20 years ago, we still remember them today. So with a myth, with a story, if you have a, uh, a way of telling it, that can encapsulate knowledge, it's a fantastic methodology of, of learning. And they're always, always passed on in an oral tradition, and we have the knowledge and information inside us, in our memory, so we can remember and help the myth to use the myth to help us in our life. It wasn't written down, it wasn't on an iPad, it was there as a, a way to help us in daily life. And the myths are not something that existed long ago and don't exist anymore. Myths are with us today in our culture. Do you know what part you are? Does anybody know what you are? I drink some water. Where are myths today in our society? Movies. Hmm. Movies. What type of movies? Disney movies. Any other movies? Comic movies. Avengers. Batman, <laughs> Superman, those very, the most popular movies of all time, and the most popular books, or the best selling books of all time, have a mythological theme in them. Because in the myth, they, we recognize something in the, the story that's inside of us, we identify with it, and we're inspired by the hero or heroine in that story. Does that make sense a little bit? Mm -hmm. And it's something that transmits. And we still have it today, and we're going to have it for a long, long, long time in the future, maybe forever, because it's part of being human. We could recognize these eternal motifs or archetypes, and they're told in a story. So we still have them today. And the Az Aztecs had them. And they're very important for the Aztecs, and like many different traditions and cultures. But the myths were used to, uh, how to understand the myths is through symbols. So the Aztecs use uh, the symbols to tell the story of the myth. A symbol, the word means a bridge. 
So the symbol is a bridge to something true or timeless. And when we understand the symbols in or the metaphors within the myth, well then we can unlock the information, the knowledge, the wisdom in a myth. And here I'm going to try to explain one symbol for the Aztecs. And the symbol is a, a figure called Quetzalcoatl. Uh, he was one of their gods. And philosophically, a god represents a principle of life, a law of life. And Quetzal is the Quetzalcoatl is the, the bird, represents the bird, and Quetzal represents the snake. I think Marcus mentioned this in Empathy of the snake. Did he mention the snake? Did he? Yeah, okay. he did. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Cobras. 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 He did. So there were symbols in that culture as well, but the symbols also in Aztecs we see it. And what this represents, the the feathered serpent, that's what the symbol means, feathered serpent. So it means there's a bird and there's a snake. The bird flies up, gains vert uh, verticality, the bird can see all around it, can maintain its position and height, and the vertical height, and stay there. And it can go up and down. The serpent is something that goes along the earth, goes into the earth, comes out of the earth. So you're joining two movements together, a vertical movement and a horizontal movement. And these two movements express something in the nature of reality, the nature of life, the nature of us. We have two movements inside the human being, but we're part of nature, not separate from it. So there's two movements inside of us. Another way of explaining this symbol is there's a movement out and there's a movement in. Just different symbols, different ways of explaining it. And what the Aztecs are trying to explain this symbol, using this principle of life, is there's a movement out, a movement out to experience, to, have, um, to do things, um, and then some movement back in to qualify those experiences, to learn a lesson from the experiences. When we bring the experience uh, lesson, we breathe back in, we move back in, we breathe in, we try to learn something, and our elevation, our consciousness elevates a little bit. So it's a movement up. And from that perspective, from that elevation, then we go back out into the world again with those new understandings, those new learnings. And it's a process of breathing in, breathing out, to to grow, to, to improve. That's all in a little symbol like that. The rational mind finds us very difficult to understand this. If, if you try to understand this with the rational mind, the black and white mind, the computer mind, it doesn't understand it. You, you just laugh that this is, a, this is a joke. But if you understand it more with intuitive part of our psyche, which Carol Jung, Mercedes Ad, and Joseph Campbell, many other scholars have explained through the works, it's a different way of understanding life. Because understanding life is two different modalities. One is mythos and logos. So, that is a symbol. And there's different repre representations of Quetzalcoatl in, in Aztec um, buildings, in some of their writings and codexes. You can see it um, represented here. And I'm going to um, show a different representation of a symbol of Quetzalcoatl about a myth of Quetzalcoatl. And I want to see what you think it means. What does this symbol and myth mean from looking at this, these, these um, pictures and artifacts? So Quetzalcoatl. Quetzalcoatl is also the god of uh, wisdom. Because through that mo vertical motion, horizontal motion, the internal in and out, we learn from the experiences, but we learn, we grow in wisdom and knowledge. So that's why he was called the the God of wisdom and the God of knowledge. Any ideas what these mean? Because when the conquistadors went to Mesoamerica and saw this, this for them was a bit shocking. Because it looks like a, a snake or a serpent eating people. What does the what does the what would you think that meant to them? What would you think the conquistadors? What do you think they thought it was? No. Pardon? No. Well, I mean, what did it think? Yeah, you're right. Well, what did it think that figure represented? The snake. The devil. The devil, yes. So for them, it was the devil eating people. And for them, that was very shocking. And they burned them out of books because they didn't understand the symbolism. But what do you think the symbolism means? Any ideas? Yeah? The hero's journey? Yeah, the hero's journey for sure. Anything else? 
the weakness of human being? Oh, yeah. yeah, the weakness, uh, you, you discover your weakness, yeah. so you can, you discover your weakness by going into the, the serpent, the pot of guapo. So, yeah, anything else? I'm taking a hint from you, you say that they represent wisdom, so that means the futility of human mind versus infinite wisdom. Yeah, can represent that too, yeah. Symbol yeah. represents many things. Yeah. Anybody else? Uh, it's getting growth by knowledge or the truth. Pardon, say again. Getting like us getting through the knowledge and the truth, going through it. Yeah, going through it. I like that. Yeah. So, my my uh, uh, reflection on this is: so it's the human being being um, absorbed away in parts of quattro, and it's a process of going into the unknown, going into something you're not sure of yet, going head first into something. Do you ever have the expression, you go head first into something, you have no idea, I'm going to go for it. I'm going to face the tests. Someone mentioned back there, uh, Joseph Campbell. Joseph Campbell explains this symbol as the hero's journey. And the hero is that man or woman who accepts they don't know, but wants to grow in knowledge, wants to grow in wisdom. And accepts that they are going to face something they haven't faced before, that's a test. There's a difference between a test and a challenge. A challenge is something we've done before, we've experienced it, but it puts us out of our comfort zone a little bit. But a test, mythologically, is we haven't experienced this before. This is going to be something we're going to face, and it's going to awaken something with us if we choose to test. And the hero goes with his some quality or tool that's inside himself or herself to face that journey into the unknown. Through that test, through that journey, if we are open to it, if we use our tool, our weapon, a tool of such tools as wisdom, courage, beauty, discipline, willpower, well, we can learn from experience. And after a period of time, we emerge from Quetzal Coatl different. We're not the same person we were yesterday. We've improved. And it's a journey, then we return to the, in the known world. But then we go back in again, and there's a process of going in and out. So the Aztecs would say, we went through Quetzalcoatl, and we came out transformed. It's a very interesting symbol, I find. I don't know. It's a very universal theme, this idea of being absorbed, going through uh, a death, and a rebirth. But this is all inner. This is not to be taken literally. There are no snakes in Mesoamerica when we're not eating people. <laughs> but maybe some people, if someone read a myth or, or, or a symbol literally, which people have done in like, true humanity's history, you know, it's a misunderstanding. Any questions so far? About that or... Where did they come up with all this? Like, were they really just so spiritual? Like, did they meditate on these images, this imagery, or... Yeah, yeah. good question, yeah. It's, um, so, they use, for symbols to use in the natural world around them, to, and the, the characteristics or the behaviour of the natural world around them, to explain these principles of life. Um, so, um, the bird is something that elevates, it goes high. Um, why did you exactly use a snake? But the snake was also a representation of renewal because the snake sheds its skin and gets a new skin. So symbolically for them, the snake represents renewal, rebirth. And an image as well is, I think the snake also takes its prey, absorbs the whole thing and digests it. So it was to use the natural world around them to help explain these principles of life. Also, there's a also the mention of the collective unconscious, what Carl Jung would say. It's both the natural world and something inside of us, that natural need inside of us, and they merge to create this. Does that help a little bit? Yeah, yeah. Cool. Okay. So that's the dermatology. So that was one way of trying to understand the world, understand the human being. Um, another dimension, or, or lens that we're going to try to help understand the Aztecs is true philosophy. 
And the Aztecs did have philosophers and they did have a philosophy. And the word philosophy means, in, in the Greek world, philosophia means love of wisdom. So the philosophers, as a man or woman, who realize they don't, they're, they're lacking in wisdom, and want to grow in wisdom. And they fall in love with what they don't have yet. So it's a process of growing and transformation. The Aztec, as well, they had a word for philosopher. And it means, the word they have is, I should have it here. Talam Tela, sorry, Talatini. Talatini. No. It was written there. There it is. Talmatini. So they had a word of philosophy, Talmatini. And it means, if it's translated, he or she who knows things. So it doesn't seem very profound. Philosophy is someone who knows things. Because we know lots of things, don't we? But what did it mean by that? And thankfully, there is a, 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 a book or a text written that explains what that means. What does it mean to know things? And one of the things that the philosopher uh, <coughs> strives for is to discover the truth, to know truth, or become closer with truth, or to teach truth. And the Aztec word for truth, the root, means, the root of the word means uh, foundation, or roots. So someone who wants to discover the truth is someone who wants to have a, a solid foundation, who wants to grow roots, who wants to have stability in their life. So a philosopher wants to have someone to have stability, so when life comes along sometimes and gives us a, a shake, we're stable, we're able to take it, we're not flattened over. That's what truth means to them. It's a very different understanding of what we understand today. A friend of mine, he explains, he explained to me that today some people see truth as mental decoration, that we understand things intellectually, we understand the truth intellectually. But there's a difference between understanding something intellectually with our head and connecting that with our heart and our hands. Because when we put that intellectual understanding and we, we fall in love with it, philosophia, and we act, then we gain closer, we get closer to the truth. Because we make mistakes, we, we realize our understanding was very limited, and we practice, and that helps us to awaken or unveil the truth. And that's a process, it's not a thing. The truth is a verb, it's something to enter into, it's an action. So the Aztecs were very practical, very practical people. And for them, the truth was something you lived. If you taught something well, you put it into practice. There's no disconnection for them. They were very much like the Stoics in ancient uh, Rome or Buddhism in India. For them, uh, it was a very practical approach to life, to put the ideas, the values into practice. Because at that time, there was lots of problems, lots of conflicts in the world, and they wanted a very practical philosophy. There's another few descriptions of what the Aztecs thought of what the philosophy was. And one was um, to put a mirror before others, he causes a face to appear in them. So what does that mean? He causes a face. So let's try to unravel that a little bit. So for the Aztec, um, they used the word face in a very particular way. Do you, ever, do you ever hear the expression, someone to give, give what's the expression, to put your best face on? Does that make sense? To, what's the expression? Someone can help me with that. To, uh, to put on a good face. Does that make sense to people? There's another expression is someone who's two-faced. So all this, yes? Better than put a brave face. Oh, put on a brave face, thank you. what you're looking for. Yes, but that's another thank you. That's another expression. So we have this idea is that we have an external face, but behind that, there's something else happening. So the face is an external, but then there's something behind it that's also animating it that people can't see. So the idea of the face is there are many faces. What the Aztec says there's many. We have many faces. We have a physical face. But they also explain that we have an emotional face, an energetic face, and a mental face, and a spiritual face. A human being has many faces, and they're all interconnected, all interdependent. And you can see here in the diagram the external face with the eyes closed, eyelids, eyelids closed. And then we have other faces that the eyes are opening. 
And the more you go in, the, the smile is starting to emerge. It's a very interesting image. When I saw this, I said, ah, this is very interesting. And what I think that explains symbolically is that we have many faces. The external face is something that doesn't contain the truth. It's, it's closed. But the more we go inwards, the more we are, our eyes are open. What the Buddha says, we become a bit more enlightened. We can see things better. It's connected to that idea of that movement up and the movement out. The experience of, 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 of seeing. So for them, the human being had many faces, or what the Greeks would call the personality. The root, the word means persona, means mask. The external face is a mask, but there's something behind that that's animating it. So what does the word, the mirror means? So the, to put a mirror before others to help them see the, the see the appear, the face to appear in them. But a mirror, the function of a mirror is to to reflect something that's placed in front of it, so we can see it, see things properly, without distortions. When we put our physical face in front of a mirror, well, we see the perfections and we see, well, some imperfections. So a mirror gives us a true image of things. But what the Aztecs also explain is there's also inner mirrors, things that we helps us to see who we are, to see our faces, to see who we truly are with our perfections and imperfections. And um, how does that look like? So when we go through our experiences, when we have our experiences every day, if we put a mirror in front of ourselves, we can see what's happening, we can put our consciousness in what we're doing, and we can learn from our experiences. It's called reflection, introspection, learning from experiences, the small experiences, the big experiences. People can be a mirror to us as well. Sometimes people tell us things about ourselves that we haven't observed. I don't know if you've had that experience. Mm. Where people say, you've done such a thing in such a way. I say, no, I'm not like that. What are you talking about? That's someone else. So people can be a reflection to us. So there's many mirrors, internal mirrors, external mirrors. And what that's like to say about this is, the first thing is, first stage is discover that we have a face. We have a personality. We have many different dimensions to ourselves. We have an energetic, sorry, a physical, energetic, emotional, mental, <coughs> spiritual. We want to become aware of that so we can develop it. So we give them a face. This is from the Aztecs themselves. This is what they say. We give them a face. He needs them to develop it. So we discover a face so we can develop it. We can understand ourselves. We can learn from the experiences we can improve. And for them, that was a process of education. And the word for that text of education has two meanings. One was to give, to give wisdom to the face, so help us to know ourselves, or to say to know, discover ourselves, to know who we are, with the perfections and imperfections. Because we need to know both. If you only know what we're good at or comp we have our competencies and we only neglect the other dimensions to ourselves, we're, we're limiting ourselves. The Buddhists say if we don't um, discover our true self, we're going to suffer a lot in life. So the word, that's the word for education means first to discover and to know ourselves and the second thing is to strengthen the human being. That's the next purpose of uh, education is to strengthen us. So first to understand, to know, and to use that knowledge to strengthen the human being, to strengthen us. It's the same with the uh, our word education today, educare, is the same when you translate the word, it has two meanings. One is to, to know, to awaken our inner potential, but then the other one is to put, in, put that inner potential into practice. It's the same idea, the two different civilizations, I find that fascinating. The same word, it's the same connotation. So, Also, the philosophers here, she, who is a guide to human affairs, the philosopher for that text was not only someone who has concern for himself, but it's a concern for others. Understanding that we're not disconnected from the world, but there's an interconnectivity, there's an interdependence between everyone and everything. We see that in nature, but also in the society, the concept of citizenship. 
And before I talk about the last one, I want to look at the, the Aztec view of the soul. And here, it was the same idea with faces, but they just represented symbolically in a different way. They used different symbols to represent the human being. And what they explain is, the human being has a physical body, but what animates, what gives energy to that physical body? It's tonali. And tonali is energy that gives um, um, vitality to that physical body. Because what's the difference between a living human being and a dead human being that's lacking energy, vitality? But the human being also has not only energies, but has a world of emotions. I can't pronounce that word. I tried. <laughs> but it's not important how it's pronounced, but it's the idea behind this. We have an emotional world as well. We feel things. They call them passions, emotions, but it's also higher sentiments. The world of emotions goes up, up and down. Sometimes we're low with passions, we can be very explosive. But we can also have a sense of higher sentiments, beauty, goodness, justice. Also, but also the human being has a mind and a spirit. And this explain that the mind and the spirit is what exists after death. The mind for them is the, what the, is discerning. And for the Aztecs, when the human and the, the personality of the face dies, that part goes to the other side, another dimension. This is, when I saw that, I thought this was fascinating. It's very symbolically how to describe it. And that relate, this image relates to the last point. What was very important for the Aztecs in their, in their philosophy and in their culture, actually, was and this is how to maintain their balance on the slippery earth. This is something very important for them. And the words or the translation of this, what the image they, 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 they give is, it's like a path on the top of a mountain. And it's a very narrow path. And if you fall off it, there's uh, it's deep recesses each side and there's jags, um, you can hurt yourself either side. So if you walk along the path, <coughs> things go well. But if you go off it, you hurt yourself, you suffer. So this is a very universal theme in philosophy and mythology, is the idea of don't nothing in excess. The Buddha talks about it, the middle way. Aristotle talks about it, the golden mean. What generally happens to us in life? We tend to go to extremes. Perhaps we leave things to the last moment. Perhaps we, um, we procrastinate. Perhaps we, um, we, we're afraid of something. We don't face it. Maybe you just haven't had these experiences. Maybe it was just the Aztecs. But the Aztecs, as human beings, they had these experiences. And they explain, okay, these, there's a path, but how, why do we go into the excesses? What pushes us into our excesses? And what they explain is, well, there's different parts of ourselves, our emotions, the body, our energies, and the calculating mind, that, that if we listen to them, it forces us into excesses and we go into extremes. But if there's that vertical movement in life, as Aztecs explain, we can learn from those that experience, those are experiences, and we go less into the extremes, and we can stay on the path. And in Buddhism, this way, we suffer less.